in 1919, about a century ago, the Cincinnati Reds beat the Chicago White Sox in the Baseball World Series. Come to find out, the game was fixed. This um, Chicago White Sox actually basically laid down for the Cincinnati Reds in order to win a bet that they had on the side. So the Cincinnati Reds, they won the game because the game was fixed. They would have run regardless of how they played. Well, in our lesson today, God is telling Joshua back then and us right now that when it comes to the Jerichos that we have to face in this life, is a fixed fight and we already won. Hey, I'm Minister Adam and Sunday School is now in session. Welcome to JCC Sunday School Lesson for March 14th, 2021. The title of this International Sunday School Lesson in Boyd's Commentary, as well as Towson's Press International Sunday School Commentary is Joshua, the Prophet of Conquest. Hey, if you enjoy our lessons, please let's, let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, and hitting the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Let's get into our lesson for today. The unifying topic of our lesson today is making wise choices. And our scripture will be coming from Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through chapter 6, verses 5. And also in, in chapter 6, we'll be looking at verses 15, 16, and 20. Now, our main thought will be coming out of Joshua chapter 6, verse 2, and we'll be in a New Living Translation of the Bible today. And it reads, But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all of its strong warriors. The aim of our lesson today is by the end of this lesson, we will examine how Joshua acted obediently to the, uh, to the vision of God, reflect on our inefficiency uh, when challenges overwhelm us, and Commit to obeying God, especially during these challenging times. Now, as we do each week, we'll start off with a little bit of background. Now, we're in our second lesson of the unit um, that we started last week called Faithful Prophets. And we started off last week with Moses, who we know is considered to be the greatest prophet as God, as God chose him and him alone as a prophet to speak to face to face. All other prophets after Moses, um, including our prophet today, God spoke to them in dreams or through angels or visions. Um, it, was, it was never face to face. So this week, we're discussing Moses Armabur, his successor, Joshua, from the book of Joshua. Now, um, Joshua is the writer of the book of Joshua, which was written for the Israelites to remember how God brought them up out of Egypt into the promised land, also called the land of Canaan. Now, leading up to our lesson today, We'll find that Moses have died. Joshua is now the anointed and appointed leader of the Israelites. He takes the helm and he leads God's people actually into the promised land. It was Joshua who actually led them across the Jordan River to the promised land. Now, we know Moses got an opportunity to look across the river and see the promised land. But it was Joshua who actually led them to the promised land. So when the inhabitants of the land of Canaan or the promised land heard about the Israelites and how they crossed the Jordan River on dry land, stories begin to spread throughout the land of how God led them across the land, uh, this river on dry land. So they feared them. They, they feared them because they saw what God was doing for them. So what happened was some of the kings in the land of Canaan, they joined forces. While others, they, uh, they re-fortified their cities to keep the Israelites out. So when the Israelites actually gets into Canaan, God led them to eat. And this is so great because if you remember, they ate manna for 40 years. Every night, every morning when they arise, God gave them manna to, to collect and eat for that particular day. But now they're in the promised land and God allowed them to eat the produce of the land. And as soon as they start eating the produce, there was no more manna because God didn't need to give them manna anymore because they were able to eat in the land of milk and honey. God is still providing for them, but now they're able to eat from the land. So the first city the Israelites come upon in the promised land was Jericho. 
Now Jericho was a secure fortress with high um, formidable walls. I mean, Joshua even sent spies into um, Jericho and that's when they met Ahab, um, it, you know, she was a prostitute and, but she knew, she heard the story about, you know, the Israelites and how God kept them and God um, caused the, the uh, Jordan River to stop flowing so they can cross over on dry land. So when the spies went to Jericho, they found out that they were there and she allowed them to hide there with her until it passed and then she got them um, out of the city. So here we are, they're about to approach Jericho at this time. And they're seeing this wall, this, uh, this wall that seemed insurmountable to them. So we find that one night Joshua heads out, leave Gilgal where his um, troops are, go near Jericho. And he wanders off more than likely. He's probably thinking of a game plan or what he plans to do, but he's going to find God have a different plan for him. And that's where our lesson picks up today in Joshua chapter 5, verses 13, which says, When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and demanded, Are you a friend or a foe? See, with everything apparently, uh, when we look at this right now, knowing that the battle is coming soon, Joshua looks like he, he's leaving Gilgad, where the rest of his troops are, go near Jericho alone to kind of scope it out. The scenes open up where we find that um, Joshua, uh, the, the, the commander of God's um, Israelites at this time, he's right there by himself and he see a man, a, a warrior or a soldier, whichever way you want to refer to him at this point, we'll find out more later of who exactly he is. But he see this person standing in front of him. And while he's trying to bear the weight of the world in, in front of him, trying to think of a plan of attack and trying to think of this, it's this figure in front of him. And when he looks at this figure in front of him, the figure is there with a sword. And you know, when there's a warrior or soldier and they have a sword in their hand, it could mean one or two things. Either they're looking on, on in a, an offensive manner or defensive manner. They could be there standing guard, meaning don't come any further, or they could be there like they're about to attack you. So it's rightfully so. Um, Joshua didn't know which one it was. So Joshua asked, hey, are you for us or are you against us? Are you a friend or are you a foe? And we're going to find out as we move down to verses 15 and 16 who this figure was. Now, the response to Joshua, this soldier says, I'm neither, he replied. I am the commander of the Lord's army. At this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your shoes for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did what he was told. Now, after Joshua asked um, this, this soldier standing in front of him, are, are you a friend or a foe? The soldier say, I'm not the one. And he goes on to tell Joshua, I am the commander of the Lord's army. Now, you see, Joshua asked the wrong question here. Joshua may be the leader of the Israelite army, but he's standing in the presence of the commander of God's army. So he have to shrink down to his level and make sure he know who he's talking to. See, when we try to go up with our trials and tribulations that we have in life, throughout our life, which we wonder, we all have them. And we want to get in that situation and we want to ask God, are you for us or against us? But the truth be told, the battle is not ours to begin with. It's the Lord's. So Joshua asked the wrong question because it wasn't a question of whether the commander of the Lord's army was with Joshua or against Joshua. It wasn't Joshua's battle. The real answer was, is Joshua with God or for God? Brothers and sisters, as we approach battles in our lives, unfortunately, sometimes we do it backwards. We turn things all around and try to push God into supporting us rather than submitting and allowing, uh, uh, submitting to God and following him. Yes, Joshua is the leader of the Israelite um, army and appointed by God. But Joshua back then, just like us right now, have to follow God and submit to his authority. 
Now is the time to stop asking God to submit to our desires, our will, and our understanding and all the things that we want. And we need to start asking God how we can better surrender and submit to his desires for us. Now, Joshua found out here that he's speaking in the presence of the commander of the Lord's army. He's looking at this commander and all he could say was, what can your faithful servant do? Joshua recognized that he was standing before the one that was actually in charge. Joshua is not in charge. He is standing in front of the person who's actually in charge. And brothers and sisters, this shows us two things. Number one, we found here that God's has a personal presence in our life. God promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us because we're his children. God is taking personal care of us, especially in these times when we have mourning and we're weeping or we're facing challenges and Jerichos in our lives that seem insurmountable. So here's Joshua alone about to face the Jericho thinking that he has the weight of the world in front of him. And there's the presence of the Lord that's comforting him at that moment. The other thing we can take from here, this is God's powerful provision. God's provision, as he promised it, he has an infinite supply of, of, of provisions for us. And that includes power and all the things that we need. So when situations seem impossible, we may look like we just can't get through it. God has the power to get us through anything. Because we can know we know we can do all things through God who strengthens us. It's just a matter of whose side we're on. Sometimes we ask the wrong question. God, are you on our side? No, God said, I'm not on your side, but are you on my side? So here, look, Joshua has a, a nice large army of his own. Pretty big army. And all of them are men of fighting age that's ready to go. But that's not all that he has. And this is what we find here. That's not all that Joshua have himself and his soldiers. We find that he also have a Marriott of God's angelic forces that's standing right there on God and ready to do God's will right away. That's us too, brothers and sisters. Sometimes when we seem alone, we have to learn to look to the hills from where our help cometh and understand that God has protection around us. He, he's providing protection for us, even though it doesn't look like it. So when Joshua is looking at this soldier with sword in hand, he can take comfort to know as God presence is with him and also God's powerful provision is standing before him. Now let's talk about this commander of God's army for a moment that's standing there before Joshua. Who exactly could he be? Well, let's start out with this. Let's talk about who he cannot be. First of all, he cannot be a human. Why? Because no human can describe himself as the commander of God's army. Joshua can say he's the commander of the Israelites as appointed by God, but no human being can say they're the commander of God's army. Can't be a human. Secondly, this cannot be an angel. Why? Because this verse goes on to say, Joshua referred to him as Lord. And what can I do as your humble servant? So it cannot, Joshua is reverencing this person. And if we look at Revelations 19.10, we find that we are not to give reverence to angels. We only give reverence to God. So that leaves us with one option. The commander of God's army that Joshua is, is visioning here is a manifestation of Jesus, the Messiah. We call this a Christophany. A Christophany is a manifestation of the pre-incarnated Christ, who is the Logos or is the Messiah, the one who reveals God. If it was only a man or an angel, he would, it, he would first of all, would have repelled Joshua's worship in response. But we find here only God get all the praise, all the glory and all the worship so we find here, this soldier is a representation of Christ. In fact, after Joshua bowed down and worshiped the, the commander, the commander says, remove your sandals for you are on holy ground. See, this is the same thing God said to Moses when Moses saw the um, burning bush. He said, remove your sandals, you are on holy ground. 
To remove your sandals is a sign of servanthood, is a sign of, of respect, is a sign of submission when you're standing on holy ground. This encounter with Christ lifted this great burden that that uh, of the battle that he was about, that Joshua was about to face, it lifted that burden from him. He recognized that he's not, it's not his battle. The battle is the Lord. The battle belongs to the commander of God's army. The weight of the world is no longer on him. God told Joshua over and over again that he would give the Israelites the promised land. He told him that he would give him Jericho. God is, this is God assuring him that victory will be his. So God is saying back then, and he's telling us right now that we also have a role to play in the battle. Let's think about it. God reassured him. And as we move on in a moment here, God is reassuring him, this battle is yours. I'm going to give Jericho to you. But the walls didn't just come tumbling down at that that moment. Joshua had a role to play in this battle. We have a role to play in our battles too. And our role is to trust, obey, and submit to God. While God's role is to be present, to provide, and protect us. Our lesson then moves on to Joshua chapter 6 verse 1, which read, Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut up because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed in or out. We find here Jericho was on lockdown specifically because they heard about what God did for the Israelites. But here's the thing, brothers and sisters, they weren't afraid of the Israelites. Listen, the walls of Jericho could never had been penetrated by the Israelites. The only thing the Israelites had were these rudimentary arrows and knives and swords and stones. None of them would have prospered against that wall of Jericho. It was fully fortified. They didn't have ladders to climb over it or anything like that. In fact, while they're being out in the opening in front of Jericho, they were vulnerable at that time. Brothers and sisters, Jericho is much like the situations we face in life. Jericho is a stronghold and we face strongholds in our lives. And that stronghold could be friends, family, children, job, sickness, addiction, evil desires, impure thoughts. These are strongholds. Strongholds is anything that's in our life that seems insurmountable. It seems like you just can't get through it. You didn't try to go around it. You tried to go under it. You tried to go over it, but it's that wall stayed up. It would not fall like Jericho. But here Joshua is giving us insight into what we need to do when we come face to face with a stronghold in our life that makes us feel inferior. As we move down to verse two, Joshua is going to show us some key ingredients that we need to understand so we can bring down some strongholds in our life as well. As we look at verse two, it says, but the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king and its strong warriors. There's our first ingredient. Joshua sowed a stronghold in his life. And guess what he did? He consulted God. We find here in verse two, it starts off with, but Jericho may be tightly shut up and no one could go in and out, but, but what did God have to say about it? It says, but God said, see, our strongholds may look insurmountable and alone, they may very well be, but when we consult God, we're no longer alone. We're with God and with God, All things are possible when we're doing his will. The trick of the enemy is to get us frustrated because the more frustrated we are, the more we we, we think about our stronghold instead of um, going and do what God tells us to do. The more frustrated we are about our stronghold, the less likely we are to even listen to God. We're so focused on the wall that we don't have it. We can't pay any attention to God. God, I don't have time for you right now. I, I, I need to go to this doctor and see what's going on. God, I don't have time for you right now. They messing me over. I got to go get them back. God, I don't have time for you right now. My, my child is, going, uh, is making me lose my mind. 
But Joshua is showing us that the key ingredients when we're facing a stronghold in our life is to consult God. And when Joshua consults God, God tells Joshua that he's already giving him Jericho. It's kings and the warriors. He's already given it over to him. But catch this. Jericho is still standing while God is telling Joshua this. See, we have to see what God is trying to show us. We have to envision our stronghold, not the way our eyes are showing it. We have to see it through God's lenses. God say, I've already given it to you. God said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. God said, all things will work for the good of those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose. So while it may look like it's insurmountable with our physical eyes, God telling us to look with our spiritual eyes is already one. It's already yours. In other words, we need to have faith. Faith is described as forsake all, I trust him. Think about that. Forsake all, I trust him. That means I'm forsaking this wall. I trust what God say. God say he's going to give me Jericho. And there's a wall out there right now. But I believe what God say, because I'm forsaking what this wall is trying to tell me. I believe what God say more. All I got to do is do what he tell me to do. See, we like Joshua, we have to begin to see our uh, to see our barriers, not with our physical eyes, but with our spiritual eyes. That also means Joshua, once again, he has a role to play in his blessing. Joshua and the Israelites, they're about to have an opportunity to participate in their blessing. How do you participate in your blessing, you ask? Good question. We obey God by doing what God tells us to do. Victory belongs to God, but we have to obey to get to that victory. Stand up um, the widow and her two sons in, in 2 Kings chapter 4. Her husband had died. The only thing he left behind, the only thing he left them was alone. So they were going the debt collector was going to come and take her sons to pay off their father's debt. And she went and consulted the prophet. In other words, she went to consult God. And God told her to collect the empty jars from your neighbors and take that little bit of oil that you have um, at home. Take that after you collect those jars and start to pour from that little jar you have. Start pouring that oil into the jars, the empty jars that you collected. And brothers and sisters, that oil flowed until she filled up the last jar. She got to participate in her blessing. God caused the oil to flow, but she had to tip the jar over for it to get into the new jar. She had to go out to collect the jars in order to start pouring into those tar those uh, empty jars. That's how we participate in our blessings. We listen to God and do what God tells us to do. The second ingredient to the stronghold, as far as tearing down the strongholds that we have in our life, the Jerichos that we have in our lives, we're fine in verses two through five, which says, God is telling him, you and your fighting men shall march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you will march around the town seven times with the priests blowing their horns. When you hear the priest um, give one long blast of their horn, have all the people shout as loud as they can, then the walls of the city will collapse and the people will uh, can charge straight into the town. So here we have it. After consulting God, we found that God gives him instruction. God gave uh, Joshua very specific instructions. First, they had to march. You see how they participating in their blessing? They had to march around Jericho once a day for six days. Watch how they had to trust God. See, as they're walking around, they're in the opening. There's no protection around them um, as they're walking around once a day as God told them to do. Their enemy has leverage on them. They could stand on the wall of Jericho and they could start throwing stuff down at them. They had to trust God that God, if you tell me to walk, I know my enemies are right there. I know they could attack me, but because you told me to do it, I trust you more than I trust what I see in front of me. So Joshua and the Israelites walked around once a day 
for six days. Now, here's the thing. They didn't walk around two times on Monday so they can skip Tuesday and then walk around on Wednesday. They had to do it as God prescribed. God said, walk around once a day for six days. Then on the seventh day, the priest shall walk ahead of them uh, with the ark, um, which is God walking with them. The ark of the covenant is God with them, with ram's horn. Now, they had to walk around on that seventh day, seven times. The tools, brothers and sisters, that God give us is uncommon to warfare. When you look at what Joshua had, you mean, God, you want me to walk around here seven times with some horns? That, that's what you want us to do? Same thing with Moses. God, you, you want me to, to lift up this rod, this piece of wood in my hand, and the, the, the Red Sea is going to part? Stand up, Gideon. God, you want me to take 300 men and a jar and a torch? To go and defeat the hundreds of thousands of men that's trying to attack us? God said yes. And because Moses said yes, the Red Sea parted. Because um, Gideon said yes, it only took 300 men in those jars to kill over 100,000 men. Because they did it the way God told them to do it. Not the way they understand, not the way they want to do it. To get through our strongholds, brothers and sisters, we have to do it the way God tells us to do it. So what? They laugh at us. What did God tell us to do it? Now, when we look at here, God telling the soldiers to march around, I want you to notice the number that keeps coming up. We have seven priests, seven horns, seven days. Uh, and on that seven days, they did seven laps. The number seven means complete or perfection. So God used a complete number of priests, a complete number of ram's horn, which it, uh, ram's horns are a symbol of strength. It's a symbol of the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee was a time that God, um, all debts were forgiven. That's what a ram's horn represented. God used a complete number of days and God used a complete number of laps. But guess what? The Israelite had some things to do. They had to completely trust God. They had to completely surrender to God's will. And they had to completely obey God's commandment. See, that number seven, complete. And after all of that, we still talking about seven, meaning the number of completion. After all of that, God gave them complete victory. After the priest blew their horn on the seventh day, the walls came tumbling down. When they couldn't physically see with their eyes, the wall come tumbling down before they actually start um, participating in their blessing. Now their physical eyes finally caught up with their spiritual eyes. Brothers and sisters, is a fixed fight and Joshua already won. Trials, tribulations, and things that seem insurmountable in our lives right now that stand in front of us as fortifications that makes us um, feel as though we're infer inferior to it. If we consult God and do what God tells us to do is a fixed fight and we already won. Now, as we move down to verse 15, it's going to start talking about the victory here, 15 and 16. And, and here's what it reads on the sixth day. The Israelites got up at dawn and they marched uh, around the town as they had done before. But this time they went around seven times. And on the seventh time, the priests sounded the loud blast on their horns. And Joshua commanded the people to shout for the Lord has given you the town. Now, God gave them instructions in, uh, in chapter six, the first part of chapter six. God gave them instructions there. But now we find out in verse 15 and 16, it came to pass. When God said it will come to pass, there's an assurance to the will of God. Joshua had to follow God's instruction completely to get the assured, assured victory that God had already given them. As I mentioned, if they had walked around seven times every day, nope, not following instructions. If they had walked down uh, around only once, not follow in instruction. That wasn't God's plan. Joshua had to do it the way God wanted him to do it. If he wanted that stronghold in front of him to fall, we have to do it the way God wants us to do it. If we want the stronghold to fall, if on that seventh and final day, if they had got tired, because all the other days they walked one time on that seventh day, they had to walk seven times. What if they got tired and decided, nah, 
We don't need to walk all seven. This ain't working anyway. Ain't that ain't even a, a, a one little um, chip falling off that wall. We're we, we going to stop. I, I, I can't do it. That's not what they did, though. They kept going because if they had done that, would the wall have come down? I doubt it. We have to follow God's plan to get the breakthrough in the walls and the strongholds in our life. Because sometimes, brothers and sisters, right before the complete victory that God has for us, it seems like the most challenging time come up. We've been fighting this battle for so long, but we start getting in a pattern and we start learning how to deal with it. And then the next thing you know, it just seemed like it's unbearable. It's the most challenging time. Like we, we want to quit the most because it seemed the hardest. But if we stay the course, that's when the breakthrough occur. If we don't throw away the towel, throw in the towel, that's when the breakthrough occur. On that seventh day, they had to walk longer than they had to walk all seven days. And then after walking all that time, on that seventh day, they had to scream and shout out for the Lord. They had to do a lot of stuff on that seventh day, but that's when the wall came tumbling down. Right before your victory, it may seem harder. Sometimes it seems like it's going to get harder before it get better. But if you're doing what God tells you to do, the walls of the strongholds in your life will fall down. This is what Joshua is showing us. But in order to do that, we have to keep moving forward. We have to keep the faith. Our last verse today comes from verse 20, which reads, When the people of Jericho called, heard the horn, um, ram's horn, they shouted to the Lord as they could, uh, as loud as they could. Suddenly, the walls of Jericho collapsed and the Israelite charged straight into town and captured it. Like the Israelites, we have to shout out to, the God, uh, shout out to God while the wall is still up, while the problem still exists. While the stronghold is still holding us down, we have to shout out and give God praise in the midst of our storm. Because it's our praise that's going to be the final step that bring it down. When we can praise him while we're going through, when we get through, we're more likely to continue praising him. They walked around in that tough town that last day and they shouted to the Lord. Then the stronghold came down. What does that tell us, brothers and sisters? It tells us that it's our praise, it's our obedience, it's our attitude of gratitude towards God that's going to bring the strongholds down in our lives. There are three things that Joshua teaches us about bringing down these strongholds that I want to go over. And here's the first one, obedience. We have to walk as God prescribed in order for the walls to fall down in our lives. The next one is we have to persevere. When the battle seemed frivolous, it seemed like it was a lost cause, we have to continue to focus more on God and less on what we see in front of us. And lastly here, we have to trust God at his word. Trust that our marching is not in vain. Trust that our good works in the midst of our storm is not in vain. One way or another, God's will will be done. And guess what? It will come to pass. In our life, we will have Jerichos, but God told Joshua back then, and he's telling us right now, it's a fixed fight, brothers and sisters, and he already won. But because he has the victory and we got him, we got the victory too. So I highly recommend, brothers and sisters, that as you pr approach the strongholds in your life, it's something that um, is old Southern saying called nevertheless. We need to develop this nevertheless attitude. Why we shouldn't do that? Because when we don't understand God's plan of attack, we need to say, nevertheless, I will do it your way, God. That means that when, when we think it's wrong, the wrong way, when we think like someone did us wrong, we want our vengeance. We want to get them. We want to get them back. But nevertheless, Father, you said that you, uh, uh, that vengeance belong to you. And you said we have to love our neighbors and we also have to love our enemies. So nevertheless, I will love. God, I disagree with what you want me to do, but nevertheless, your will be done. God, it seems like everybody's winning and I never get ahead, but nevertheless, I will continue to do your will. 
Amen. Brothers and sisters, that concludes our lesson for this week. Um, don't forget to leave us a comment, a like, and just let us know what you think. So until next week, may God bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Goodbye. Thank you.